Hello, and welcome to this NJCU Center for the Arts digital event. We would like to ask everyone to please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the program, and we will only be accepting questions and comments via the chat window. At the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, or possibly the top right if you are on a different device, you should be able to see an option for chat. If you click that, it will open the chat window where you can type your questions so that they may be read aloud and answered. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Please note, the views and opinions expressed in this virtual event and presentation are solely those of the individual artists in their personal capacity and are not reflective of nor represent official policy, position, or views of New Jersey City University. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Center for the Arts Creative Process Series. I'm Stephanie Chaikin. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts. And we've had an amazing day today. We, and we are so excited to have you here with us for an afternoon with Jazz Graf, amazing, amazing artist. You're in for a treat. Um, the program is called The Art and Impossibilities of Belonging. Um, our program will be moderated by Doris Casualo, NJCU's Interim Associate Gallery, Gallery Director, and we will also hear from the magnificent Eileen Ferrara. So to start us off today, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Doris. Um, Doris Casualo is NJCU's Interim Associate Gallery Director. She is an artist, an activist, a curator and educator. She has an MFA in integrated media arts from Hunter College and has been teaching at Hunter College, Rutgers University and New Jersey City University. Doris is co-founding director of GAIA, an artist collective working to help support women artists and the advocacy of women's issues established in 2002. She has curated group artist exhibitions showcasing the work of over 400 artists. And she is the founder and curator of the Wonder Women Residency Program, an annual group artist residency and exhibition. Her work also includes interactive sculpture, community-based performance, online digital installations, printmaking, ceramic, and fiber arts. So I'm going to toss the microphone to you, Doris, to start us off. Thank you so much, um, Stephanie Chicken. Um, I am, um, it, 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 interestingly, I'm listening to my own bio. I'm really excited to also say that I have met my co-director, Eileen Ferrara, who you, uh, mentioned is amazing, which is true, um, through Gaia and some of the events that we've done locally. Eileen Farrar is also a fellow artist and professor at NJCU, and we have both had the pleasure of working with Jazz Graph before through Gaia and some of these other vent ventures that you just mentioned, so we may, um, you know, celebrate that a little bit. Eileen and I are both very excited to uh, co-host today's event with the Center for the Arts and with you and your awesome staff. Thank you to them. Um, we are excited to welcome um, Jazz. Um, and I wanted to tell you a bit about Jazz before she tells you a whole lot. Um, she, she is Jasmine Graf. Jazz Graf is an interdisciplinary uh, artist in paper, in print, and in bookmaking. Um, she's based here in Jersey City. Um, and her work delves into the meaning of familial roots, uh, her mixed race identity, exploring these hidden family traditions, traditional practices, spirituality and ritual. Um, considering these layered histories, mythologies and ecologies in her work, um, it ruminates, uh, her work ruminates on our, all of our connection to place, location, location of identity, and the paradox of presence. Her bio also includes lots of exhibition and accomplishment, both locally and internationally. 
Um, she has been featured in AM New York News, the Jersey Journal, and Jaffe Center for the Arts. She's the former president, vice president of Manhattan Graphic Center in New York and a board member of Pro Arts Hudson County. She holds a master's degree in studio art printmaking from the University of Notre, of Notre Dame and a master of fine arts in print media from the University of Iowa. I'm so excited to welcome Jazz Graff for this event. Thank you, Jazz, for being here. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Doris, and thank you, Eileen, for extending this lovely invitation to um, share uh, my work. Um, and also, I want to extend my appreciation to Stephanie Chaikin, Anna Carhart, Sabrina Sabalo, Justin Tinker, and all of the folks behind the scenes at NJCU and the Center for the Arts and for all your extraordinary efforts in making this event possible. Um, it's so fabulous to see so many familiar faces and names. Um, I miss you all so much. And um, also to see um, a lot of new people here. So um, thanks, thanks for your presence. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get started. Anna, can you cue up the slideshow? All right. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Jazz Graff. And what I hope to share with you today are some constellations in my orbit um, to share with you some of the experiences that I've had, the work that I make, you know, where is it coming from? How, you know, what things are influencing me? And <clears throat> ultimately, what is the work becoming? And how does it engage with other constellations? and with other conversations. And so my approach is to, um, is to act as though you're in my studio and we're hanging out. And so um, as we go, um, I do welcome you to use the chat freely, informally and formally to ask questions, share reactions. I would love that so much. Um, and then we'll get into that afterwards. And by the way, the QR code um, will take you to my website where you can see more. Okay, next slide, please. So why the title, The Art and Impossibilities of Belonging? Um, so it's meant to be read as both the possibilities and the impossibilities. And, um, you know, belonging is a basic human need. And I define it as having it's finding a certain degree of acceptance, both internally and externally, be it with a family, a group of friends in the workplace, the country that you live in, um, maybe it's the country that you come from, um, the school that you attend. And belonging is an essential part of connection. And I believe that art is a space in which one can find or even make that sense of belonging. And it allows us, art allows us to feel a part of something. And the foundations of my artwork often draw from personal experience and the work becomes an extension of what it means for me to belong and to connect. And it's where I negotiate identity, it's where I explore otherness and my tendency of combining materials speaks to my interest in hybridity. Next. So today I'll be talking uh, mainly about a more recent body of work with themes that are related to rivers, materiality, family history, collective knowledge, and public memory. Next. A little bit of background about me um, is that I worked for many years um, in New York City with a nonprofit where I was advocating for fresh water. Um, I was curating shows for conservation photographers, um, as well as uh, mixed media artists, all kinds of artists, and generating content about the interconnectivity of bodies of water and their ecosystems. And I remember um, seeing a lot of aerial images and satellite images and drone photography. Um, and I remember that it was really a shift in how I was thinking about the landscape and also navigating my way through it. And so, it, um, you know, these aerial images really influenced how I began to see the world. And this is a laser etched piece of muslin based on a satellite image of a delta, of a river delta. Next. 
The weave spoke of pixels on a screen and its material fragility resonated with just how delicate our watersheds are. Next. In my here and after series, I lithographically printed aerial and satellite images of rivers onto muslin material. Next. Um, and in each print, um, there's actually two printed layers. Ah, someone asked about the size. So yeah, these are about 10 by 10 inches. This is a little bit larger, maybe 10 by 20. Um, and so yeah, each print, there's actually two printed layers with the images facing one another. The top piece of muslin um, is actually the back of a print that we're looking at, and it has an absence. Next. And that absence is a laser cut out of the shape of another watershed, which becomes a window to view the second layer of the print. And in the many years that I had been studying the ebb and flow of waterways, researching how the state of being connected with each other was reflected in our environment, what I realized after stepping back from this series um, is that it was telling a deeper story of something that I was processing internally. I had recently lost my grandmother and my auntie in Thailand, and my mother brought back photographs of the funeral rituals. And that's when I started learning about our family's tradition um, of cremation and all the accompanying ceremonies that lasted for days. Um, and when I called my cousin one day to talk about it, she was actually, she, she was on the river and she was just about to release her own mother's ashes at that moment. And so that was just the beginning of stories that began to sort of un, you know, auspiciously unfold around this time. Next. I, I used those fabric prints, so I had a whole bunch of them, and I used them to create matrices to make blueprints also known as cyanotypes. And I would print various deltas of the world. And so I'm exposing them. I'm using the fabric prints as the matrices to expose blueprints. Um, and then I'm printing them on paper and I'm, I've stitched them together with the unified river of thread um, in this book, a literal connective thread which runs across the entirety of the accordion book. But also metaphorically, it was the sort of ephemeral ghost river hovering over the fragmented landscapes. And the book here, troph or the title, Trophic Evulsions, um, is kind of two different ideas that I'm putting together. This idea of trophic cascade, where um, one thing happens that leads to a bunch of, like if you take one species out of the equation, it has this sort of domino effect on the ecosystem. Um, and this, this idea of avulsion, um, which is sort of like the detachment or separation of, of land bodies and water. Um, next slide, please. Um, but at the same time, while the stitch is connecting, it also punctures, and it's meant to be read as marks of human intrusion. Next. Interconnectedness is an undercurrent throughout my body of work, and so I considered my very first relational bond in this world to my mother, and she left many of her stories behind when she came to America. And in my work, I, I do hope to preserve them. And I've etched replicas of pages from an old family album into copper. This plate, uh, or the, the, the piece itself is the plate uh, or the matrix as it's referred to in printmaking. Um, and so those of you that have done this process, the matrix itself is usually, it's seen in reverse. It's everything is reversed because when you pull a print, that's when it's right reading. Um, and so it's etched onto mirror finished copper. And the title correlates to not only the matrix, but how when we see the work, uh, we see a reflection of ourselves because when we look at family albums, I mean, it's really a reflection of ourselves that we're looking at. Next slide, please. My mom was born in Bangkok, Thailand, which is situated right around the oxbow of the Japia River, which empties into the Gulf of Thailand. And uh, you can see how dense the city area is right around that oxbow, which is also known as the green lung of the city. And I just love this sort of um, green ribbon. It's like this calligraphic signature um, of this river um, that runs through the country. And, um, and also thinking about 
just how much engineering it takes to maintain um, this specific shape. Um, next slide, please. The Thai word for river is menam, which literally translates into this work's title, Mother Water. And the Japia is the river where my mother grew up, um, and it's the river that she crossed regularly. And its headwaters, the river's headwaters, are where generations of our ancestors' ashes, uh, where their ashes have been released. And it was a way of their spirits to be free. And as I thought about their ashes floating down river, and um, I started to think about the Delta again as being infused with new meaning and significance, because it was a site where all these ashes had accumulated in the mud. And it was this sort of transitory space in which the river emptied into a larger body of water, a place where the sediment became an embodiment of collected, collective histories. Next. And I began working with clay uh, with this in my mind, that the earthen material is not separate from human existence, rather extensions of it. And again, here the work is composed of two layers, the bottom layer of blueprints and a top layer with the satellite image um, of the Japia River. And I should mention that I made the blueprints from uh, a matrix of painting with clay and sediment. So I'm using a clear substrate and I'm painting um, with very wet clay and sediment. And as I'm working, it's sort of chafing off, I'm scratching into it, I'm folding it. And then I'm using that to expose a blueprint. And so that's the layer that you see beneath um, the sort of acrylic panels. And um, traditionally, uh, the blueprint, right, is a medium which depicts architecture. Um, but I use it to depict the building up of these ancestral histories that's represented in the earthen material. And I like using this medium because it produces an image of something that was once there. Um, it's creating a sort of shadow print of an actual thing. And so conceptually, this felt very much in alignment with how I started to think about sediment. And um, the top layer here, which are laser etched acrylic, um, the pigmentation, the white pigment is actually made from porcelain dust being rubbed into the grooves. Next slide. And the more I worked with these themes about maternal lineage, I, I gravitated towards an iterative process. And so I'm thinking about lineage and I'm thinking about like, how do I take these matrices and then apply them in different contexts? And it sort of becomes like these, these families, the pieces become like part of the lineage itself. Um, and I had recently read Leo Steinberg's The Flatbed Picture Plane, where he describes a noticeable shift in the pictorial surface specific to the 1960s. And rather, rather than the dominant objective of an artwork um, now as a window, in, window into space, image construction becomes much more self-critical and the picture plane becomes a surface in which the viewer is assembling information and it's a much more operational process involved with seeing and understanding that image. Next. And these notions of positionality really resonated with me, um, especially in the context of viewing the landscape, that humans are not separate from nature and that culture is something that we make. Next. Steinberg noted this as a shift from nature to culture. And I sort of noticed this too in my studio practice um, because rather than using up wall space, I had switched to using up a lot, of more, a lot more table space. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, the Japia River became a sort of case study watershed um, and ultimately the metaphorical and geographical core of my work. Next slide, please. I'll take you to a short video. Hey, welcome to my studio here at Gallery of Faro, where there's five floors of artist studios and a large exhibition space. And I've been here for about a year and in my studio, um, it's an important place for me because 
anything goes. I can work on finishing a piece for an exhibition or I can work on something and like it might be unresolved. I might feel like it's a failed piece or an experiment, but I am able to learn from it. And so it's really important that I have a space that is a safe space for me to do that. Um, everything that I make is certainly not going to be something I'm happy with. Um, and so I get to work it out here in the studio. And um, I think of the studio as a sort of in-between space. And I, I like to play with the theme of in-betweenness in my work, not only because of my own background and my cultural heritage, but also the studio as being, um, it represents a space of transition and continuity of the work. So it's most of the work that you'll see in an artist studio, it is in process of becoming. Um, and so that's why to me, the studio is a really important place to make work. So I'd like to show you around and describe some of the things that I have going on here, some things that are in the middle of being worked on, other things that are um, on display. Um, I make a lot of handmade paper and um, I do sculptural paper making. I make sheets of paper that sometimes get sewn into handmade books. And I also, um, I also make <clears throat> prints on paper. So here the pulp is drying. And after it's dried on the interleaving, I peel it off um, and it creates a thin sheet of paper. And then I just hold it to the light and I check out the fiber distribution. This one's pretty even, so that's good. Um, and then I'll, basically I have a whole stack of um, sheets of paper that I've made on reserve for when I wanna do an edition of prints or for when I wanna make books um, in my flat files here. Here are some other handmade sheets of paper. Um, these, um, I don't put a dye in it. They're actually based on the color of this fabric. So this sort of turmeric colored fabric is, uh, it's a worn Buddhist monk robe. And there's different types of Buddhists. So they wear different colored robes. And if I incorporated that fabric into the handmade paper. And what I also do here is um, I make prints and these are also handmade paper. This is made from a different type of plant. This is a lot thicker than the sheet I just showed you. Um, and this paper is made from Thai mulberry. So this is a plant that grows in Thailand. Um, it's been very important to understanding my own ancestral history um, and Thai traditions that I aim to preserve. And the print here is a cyanotype print. It's a photographic process. After I make the sheet of paper, I coat it with a light sensitive liquid, and then I expose it to UV light. And I'm able to do that here in the studio. This is an exposure unit. Um, I flip on the switch here, and this, um, the paper is put here and exposed to the light, and it creates a blueprint. And other pieces, the, I can show you, um, this is a piece I've just created um, last week here in the studio. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, it's a combination of cyanotype and then this gold line here is a satellite image of a watershed. These are some satellite trails. Um, I really like the geometry of it. So, and in my flat files, I store all my prints and my handmade papers. Um, and I show them to curators or when I have studio visits, I will show out, show some of my work. Um, I have some other cyanotypes here in my studio. This is a combination of working with paper. This is machine made paper and with muslin. So a uh, thin cotton fabric. And here the design is based on the codex form. And the codex is this sort of bilateral rectangle, which represents a book form. So it's a signifier of knowledge. And this is a recurrent symbol in my work. Um, I also do make books. And this is a handmade book. Um, this is the French loop stitch. So these are other things that I do here in my studio as I stitch books. Um, and in, the, in Asia, in many, in many parts of Asia, 
Um, the palm leaf manuscript is a popular book format, and this is obviously an enlarged version, but um, these would be made out of palm leaves, and then the top and the bottom covers would be made out of um, wood or metal perhaps. And this piece is based on my grandmother's silk textile. Um, it was a wrap skirt that she put around her body. And so I've done the cyanotype print to show the different pattern that was woven in the Thai silk. I've made the rope that holds it together as well as these pages with the prints and the top and the bottom covers are made out of Thai mulberry, the same as the rope and um, some other papers that I have here. Um, these are abaca sheets, and these are also uh, made with the monk robe embedded into the paper itself. And there are various tones because they might be made with different robes. Um, and what's special about these is they were donated to me by um, a bikuni, which is a female monk in Thailand which has not been recognized as being legitimate. Um, but after about a thousand years, they revived this group of female monks um, and they're fighting for their own spiritual practice. Um, we could talk a little bit about that later um, because it's a really interesting story. Um, and so these are a couple more cyanotypes that I've made. And these are also combined with silkscreen prints. So the cyanotype is a type of print in which the pigment or the thing that colors it is embedded in the paper, whereas the silk screen sits on top of the paper. Um, and this is a, a pattern of a river here, um, and it distributes water to these different agricultural plots. It's, the image is based on a satellite image. And to just show you a little bit about what silk screen is, is um, it's a fine mesh, and there's a resist, which is closed off and some parts are open and you push ink through the screen and it results in this type of print here. Um, when I first started out here around New York City, I would make these prints, I would make these silkscreen prints and I would sell them on the streets in New York City in front of the Metropolitan Museum. And then I was out in Soho, um, sort of that first New York artist experience I had. Um, and then there's some other pieces here where I'm incorporating more of the monk robe into the handmade paper. Um, here's my little sewing station here when I work with fabric and textiles. Um, this piece here is more recent as well. Um, it incorporates, these are called inclusions, and the inclusions also um, in, are the Hudson Estuary sediment. And the Hudson River has been really important to me because I was born in the Hudson Valley and I've lived most of my life along this river. And the river represents um, a passage of my, my parents when they you know, immigrated to the United States. The Hudson River has played um, a significant role in my life. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna keep going, even though um, there were two videos that were kind of swapped. Um, if we could go back to the uh, presentation, we'll just put the other one in in place of where the other one went. Um, so thank you. Um, and so paper objects are representations of their natural and built environments. And I look to paper not only for the ideological content that it may carry, but to its material capacities to record time and ecologies which trace the historical dialogue between nature and civilizations. And I approach paper, prints, and books as social, cultural, and symbolic forms of capital. I'm interested in how they influence ideas of national identity and um, how ultimately they shape public attitudes. And Buddhism has a very strong influence on Thai culture. And I grew up giving offerings of water and fruits to my mother's Buddha and never pointing my feet at it. Um, and even our house was blessed by monks um, who left a little swirly finger mark on our front door that couldn't be washed off. 
Um, and so the monk robe itself is a very powerful symbol. And I started making handmade paper with worn Buddhist monk robes um, while I was studying Eastern style paper making at the University of Iowa with Tim Barrett at the center for the book. Next slide. But before I embarked on the project, I reached out to a bunch of Thai students on campus. And then I said, hey, you know, like, do you think that me destroying these robes uh, would be offensive or disrespectful? And I'm, I'm using them to make paper and to make artwork. Um, and so we had this discussion and they ended up calling their relatives in Thailand and then their relatives would go to the local temple and then chat with the elder monks. Um, and then the next thing I knew, I had friends and family who were carrying robes for me on airplanes and then sending them through the mail. And um, I was making long strips of paper. I'm mixing the sacred material with plant fibers and materials that uh, were about my own life story. Um, pieces of my rejected prints, Hudson estuary dirt, um, tea leaves that were grown at my childhood home. So you get the idea. Um, next. And the process of making the paper was usually a 12 hour session of pouring pulp, which reminded me of the Piti Gruat Nam, which is the Thai water pouring ceremony. And the ceremony is a dedication of merits to dead relatives in which you pour water from one receptacle into another while a monk chants a prayer. And afterwards you pour that water outside onto the soil or the roots of a tree. Water is the medium of communication to transmit the merit and the earth is the witness. And the installation uh, or in the in this installation, the base is raw clay. So it's, it's not been fired um, and I mix it heavy with bone ash and I color it with turmeric and safflower powder. And those were natural dyes that were originally used um, to give the, the monk rope its color. Next slide. These pieces or this series is a little bit more recent where I'm using, um, I'm extracting the seams from the robes um, before they get made into pulp. And so a lot of people think that the monk robe is like a flat sheet and they sort of strategically tie it around, but this is really not the case. It's, it's quite complex. Next slide. And the diagram on the bottom left shows you a common um, design of a monk robe and how it's stitched and it's based on um, rice paddy fields, which you can see on the right. And the colors of the robes correspond with the different sects of Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism is the most prevalent in Thailand. It's also believed to be the oldest lineage. And during this pandemic, I received robes from two bhikkhunis. Those are female monks. Um, and these women were ordained in the Theravada lineage um, but something you should know is that Thailand forbids women from ordaining as monks. And so women seeking spiritual advancement, they ordain elsewhere. And so currently in Thailand, it's highly debated if women can even wear these robes. And so the bhikkhunis of Thailand are seen as sort of rebels or, you know, renegades. They're subjected to a lot of discrimination and they remain largely unrecognized in Thai society. And in terms of numbers, to give you an idea, there is just over 250 bhikkhunis or female monks as opposed to the 250,000 or more male monks in the country. So it's really important that I incorporate their, the bhikkhuni robes and their stories into my project, um, advocating for their inclusion in the hopes that it will also open the door to further advocate for inclusivity of trans, non-binary and gender fluid peoples, and then support those potential imp impacts that inclusivity will bring about in the community. Um, and Dhammananda bhikkhuni, um, shown in the center. She's known for the revival of the female monks after the lineage died out nearly a thousand years ago, and she created the first bhikkhuni monastery in Thailand. Next. Patches are um, another interesting uh, type of seam that I run into, and I wanted to share this photo that was sent to me by Aya Sudama Bhikkhuni. Um, she is the first American-born Bhikkhuni to ordain in the Sri Lankan Theravadan tradition. 
Um, and so she continues to patch up her beloved upper robe and to and by wearing it, she's teaching others this intention of not desiring new things, um, finding contentment with what one has. And she wrote to me about this idea of renunciation, which I keep coming back to. Um, and so this is the this is the idea, this idea of renunciation, which guides me when I'm working with her robe is to detach from expectations of what the work is supposed to look like, how it should look, how it should function. And I'm sure that my idea of renunciation is much different, um, but I work with it conceptually and it really encourages a new freedom in the work. Um, and the little patch in my hand, I found on multiple Tamayut robes and a Tamayut refers to um, monks of the forest tradition and there really didn't appear to be any function of these patches. I didn't see any rips beneath them. There weren't any holes, like it was reinforcing something. Um, so I inquired about them with a Thai Buddhist scholar who, uh, who said that it was likely an act of superstition, like a sort of lucky mark. And it was quite frowned upon in the Buddhist or in the monastic community. But I'm not sure if that speculation really um, satisfies my curiosity. So these little patches remain an anomaly. Next slide. The saffron robe in Thailand holds power in a country with a constitutional monarchy. Even the Thai king bows down to the monk wearing the robe. Yet the robe is not accessible to all. So uh, why is it, or why do other, or other Asian countries allow female monks and not Thailand? And how does this affect books that are written and the ones who are writing the stories how does it affect public attitudes on women and their roles in society? In Thailand, monks can't vote and um, they are not to be concerned. It's because they're not to be concerned with any worldly matters at all, like politics. And in most cases, they're not able to express their political opinions even. And so another radical use of the monk robe that we see involves this practice of ordaining trees. And this um, originated in Thailand um, and has spread to surrounding countries. And it, it kind of came about because monks who were looking to meditate in the forest were finding less and less places to do so. And so we see the robe also serving as a function in environmental protections. It's often referred to as um, socially engaged Buddhism. And like the Bikini order, this type of ordination in Buddhism is also contested. Next. I'm interested in how the robe material connects to the people and the people to the land. And when I make my installations with this paper, I hope it conveys some of the ideas that I've just shared with you. So what is it that we can learn from the complex history of paper making through Thailand? Next what can be learned from the archives of how that history has been preserved? And then what about the gaps? Um, who and what has been included and excluded, deemed of importance or remains unnamed in that history? Next. These are some questions that drive my practice and are part of a larger inquiry in my body of work. Next. Uh, that's the other video. It should be like a black background. Uh, I think it's slide number nine, 18, number 18 that the video has. Traveling through Thailand independently in the last several years has been a vastly different experience than the few times I had visited my family as a kid. I found myself on unnamed back roads, too narrow for cars. Eating lunch at the mall's air-conditioned food court with awesome Thai Elvis impersonators. Navigating the Western influences in everyday street life and commuting to school in floodwaters during the rainy season to learn Thai, my mother's native language. Since I wasn't taught it growing up, I always thought of it like her secret language. 
And through language, it shed light on how thoughts and a sense of humor are woven together, social mannerisms, expressions. In Thailand, when people ask me my name, I would say Malit, which is the Thai word for jasmine. It's a very popular flower there, and it's often gifted on Mother's Day and used in ceremonial flower garlands. In recent years, I've been exploring the meaning of certain cultural traditions and engaging in Thai practices. At the headwaters of the Japia River, for generations, my ancestors' cremated ashes have been released. Thai paper making is also dependent on this water source. I'm interested in its spiritual character, mythologies, socio-political posture, and its conservation. This deeply personal connection to the river influences the way I think about the importance of rivers, the ancestral histories that accumulate in layers of sediment over time as they flow downstream, its materiality, its symbolic meaning, and how these soils are the most fertile areas for growth. It's in these soils that the Thai mulberry plant grows best. And 10 years ago at a paper making class at the Women's Studio Workshop was the first time I really worked with an art material that connected me to my ancestral heritage. It's a strong and versatile fiber to work with. It also has a beautiful lace-like quality. I studied the various techniques of how this plant has historically been used to make paper, especially in Thailand and other Asian countries. I made paper in ponds and in pet pools. Who knew? And basically any basement with a large sink. And this is a way of dispersing the pulp fiber over a screen. After the pulp dries, the piece of paper is peeled off. Paper as a material has revolutionized the spread of knowledge globally. And in the same way that words and images on a piece of paper can convey a message to transmit an idea, I incorporate specific materials into my handmade paper. And I've been collecting sacred Buddhist monk robes that have been worn by monastics. The robe itself is a powerful symbol. I was so honored to receive this robe, I held a ceremonial unveiling of it at the ocean on a full moon. It came from Aya Surama Bikuni. The word Bikuni refers to a female monk, and she wore this robe for over 10 years or more. Another robe came from Wat Nam Dang outside of Bangkok. My friends brought it over on their flights back from winter break, and I turned the robe into pulp by putting it through a mechanical beater. I'm constantly trying out new formulas of different plant fibers to mix with the robe pulp. They produce different types of sheets. Some are thicker and soft, probably best for deep embossments and printing. And some are sculptural and have a more physical presence, a relationship to the body. Some are translucent, yet very strong, and some textured and quite thin, and intended to be stitched into books. But no matter what type, I'm incessantly making them, learning what works and what doesn't, and how I can get better at making more of them. This work is currently on exhibition at the Paul Robeson Galleries in Newark, New Jersey. I install the long bands of paper like earthen layers of strata, and it's shown uniquely every time. The project continues to grow, and I hope to make more paper with communities in Thailand on my future travels. So if we could resume at slide 30, um, that would be great. Thank you. So everything is connected to water, right? Um, and many of the issues that we face with our watersheds are also shared by soil, and which is uh, often acting as a filter for the water. And it's actually harder to clean soil than it is to clean water. 
And did you know that there's actually a World Soil Day? Um, and it was created by the former king of Thailand who recognized that the quality of soil is essential, is essential for growing rice. Um, so yeah, so um, also with this in mind, um, I'm using the blueprints um, painting with clay and sediment uh, with the satellite image superimposed. Um, and it's laid out on a codex shape as though it's a passage in a book. Next. Um, and that slide and this one, um, the silk screen image is based on the satellite uh, image of the Nazca lines in Peru. Um, the pieces are about 22 by 30 inches on a sh sheet of paper. Next. And this is um, an alluvial fan which carries very fertile um, soils to agriculture, agricultural spaces. Um, same design that you saw in my studio video. And the series is called Between What Was. Next. And I once set up a studio visit and I displayed only my failed pieces and this was one of them. And I, um, I didn't mention to anyone that they were the rejects. And um, it was really a learning experience. And maybe I was more receptive or attentive to what was being said in those conversations because I had less pride, um, but it was truly a lesson in vulnerability as strength. Um, and I encourage every artist to try this sometime. Next. A more recent piece I made a couple weeks ago, I'm breaking free from the codex format and I'm leading more towards a map with the underlying grid structure. Um, this idea that it's more rhizomatic and can grow and expand in any direction. Next. As I um, started doing some stone lithography that also seemed um, in alignment with um, conceptually how I'm working with materials. Um, and themes. Uh, this is based on a state, uh, a set of state prints and the first state. So this is where you're using the stone and you, you're etching an image, but then you're, you're gradually etching it and you're pulling off prints that are sort of um, documenting the state of the stone from one print to the next. And so the first state uh, is drawn only with litho crayons. Next. And the second state is only in two swashes. This is like my favorite type of um, wash on the stone. Next. And the third state um, is with toner. And again, um, this is a two layered print. Um, the, the bottom print is a machine, machine made paper and a top print uh, is my, is the translucent handmade paper that I make. Next. And the series is called Passes Into Pages, uh, which is inspired by a line from James Salter, an American novelist who writes, life passes into pages if it passes into anything. And so I'm thinking about impermanence and the life of the page. Next. I was looking at various forms of the book and of the page inspired by the cuneiform tablet and also comparing that with the modern digital library. Um, next. And I had been working on this series um, of artist books or an artist book series that I began in 2010 where I'm transcribing the content of my journals and sketchbooks um, and I'm transcribing all of the things that I've written. I'm printing it lithographically onto fabric, and then I'm wrapping. The, I'm rewrapping um, the books with the their insides. It's called eviscera. Next. So um, I'm combining the idea of cuneiform and my artist book series, and then the look of the digital library in this piece called On Reserve, which is on exhibit at Paul Robeson Galleries right now. Next. And, and this describes the passages of the page. Um, so the first, each set of shelves describes sort of iterations of the page. It started out as pages from Art Forum magazine that I ripped out. They were coated with clay slip. They were fired as paper clay. And then they were so fragile, um, they were crushed. Um, and then from the crushed um, paper clay, I made another blueprint of the earth. And again, I'm dealing with the sort of horizontal and vertical aspects of this sort of distillation, this um, dialogue between nature and culture. 
Next. Similar to the book uh, Trophic Avulsions in the background, um, this book has uh, an ephemeral river of thread which stretches across the bisque um, tablets. Next. And then that river of thread is has been fired out in the kiln. And so the river becomes a fragile shell which crumbles over time. And then the thread bindings of the book are dysfunctional. Next. Um, but just a little bit back to paper making. Next. On the left is a wet stack of freshly made paper, also known as washi. And each sheet is separated with one single white thread. So if you look closely on the bottom right corner of the wet stack, you can see it, the, the little pieces of thread hanging out. And the washi is also super thin and so uh, ephemeral. And so I wanted to etch its portrait into stone. Next. And using a combination of Xerox transfer and building up hand drawing, um, I created this image on a litho rock. Next. And the series of prints goes through the litho press three or four times, which correspond with the numbers uh, or with correspond with, with the um, colors that are printed. Um, and that's to mimic the making of the washi paper in which three or four waves of pulp are going back and forth over the paper making mold to create the paper. Next. Next. And this is its uh, installation in a sort of round room which worked really well at the Flat Tail Gallery in North Dakota. Next. The signatures are an anatomical part of a book. So they're sort of folded um, portfolios that comprise a book. And I've made them here with porcelain exteriors and thin scorched washi pages. And each signature has a unique pattern of punctures along its spine where the pages have been stitched together. And so in that way, it's like they're from different corpora, disembodied fragments of a larger whole. Next. Palm leaves have been an important writing support throughout Southeast Asia for thousands of years. And the palm leaf manuscript, an example which is shown on the left, it was a common or is a commonly used book format in Thailand. And many were produced for religious or historical purposes as well as astrology and law and medicine. And traditionally the palm leaves have a few lines of incised text they're scrawled into um, and sometimes even contain the cremains of a revered monk. Those um, remains are mixed with the black soot and it's rubbed into the incised text. There's a long tradition of ties attributing power to objects in terms of their origins. And this ritual practice and material culture are still widely accepted. Um, I also wanna mention that, you know, um, with books, the books are also seen as teachers. They're, they're very closely related to being people. So um, like even not that long ago, my mom was taught as a schoolgirl to sort of greet a book. You know, you're, you're supposed to show your respect to a book. And, and even now people don't step on a book or step over a book because they're considered your teachers. And so um, these palm leaf manuscripts, which were often or mainly, mainly made by male monks, um, was an extension of their body, essentially um, a representation of their body. And so therefore, many women were forbidden to touch these types of books. Next. In this work, A Place to Rest One's Palms, I reclaim this book structure that has this history of exclusion. And I've made the paper ropes and covers and the printed pattern uh, inspired was inspired by my grandmother's wrap skirt. And uh, of course I'm using a garment that is wrapped normally on the lower half of a woman's body, which is intentional, um, but not as a sign of disrespect, but as a sort of empowered gesture. And the use of her Thai silk skirt references women's contributions in safeguarding cultural heritage. Mulberry, one of the plants that I used in making the book um, was also commonly grown by women to feed silkworms. And it was the beautiful Thai silk was spun 
from uh, the silkworm cocoons. And so that relationship is referenced also in the work. Next. I depicted, um, that's a, the actual photograph, a photograph of my grandmother's silk on the right. And I depicted the silk fabric um, in my print, in my cyanotype print with all of its wrinkles and folds because these marks also tell a story of its passage through generations. Engaging with some of these practices has cultivated a deeper affinity with my family and their histories on a very personal level. Um, but I also wanted to mention the importance of finding that sense of belonging in a local community. Next. Because after college, um, it was really challenging to find creative jobs and to continue producing work as an artist and especially to access resources. I wanted to mention Gaia Studios and Pro Arts Hudson County and City Hall Cultural Affairs, um, places that offered opportunities um, and spaces where I was able to engage in more critical conversations and participate in larger public initiatives. Next. And my 15 years as a key holder from Manhattan Graphic Center a print shop in New York City is where I made work and I took classes, I organized exhibitions and I served on the board, um, have been really instrumental in my development. And I, I consider this place like my second home. I really miss it. Next. And collaborations too have also helped me see things from multiple perspectives. This is a diversity mural uh, worked collaboratively uh, with Juan Sanchez in designing it um, and it's installed in, with glass tiles at the Student Center at the University of Notre Dame. Next. So just to come back uh, to the title of the talk, The Art and Impossibilities of Belonging, there's so many stories that I could tell you about what belonging feels like as a person of mixed heritage. I like to think that art is meant to expand and to challenge our ideas on what belongs and what doesn't. Um, and it's this practice that keeps me creating. Next. For anyone interested in learning more about Thai paper making, this QR code will give you access to my presentation for the College Art Association, uh, where I go into more depth about the history and the technical aspects of paper. Next. Again, um, a heartfelt thank you to everyone um, for your interest and for your support um, and for um, just kind of rolling with all the little um, imperfections um, that just are part of life and we embrace. And so do connect with me on Instagram. Uh, it's at jazzgraph, one Z, one F. And again, um, check out my website and that's where that QR code will take you. So at this point, I think we'll move on to Q and A. I welcome, I think the format is to go to the reactions part and then raise your hand and a moderator can unmute you. Um, and you can also type anything into the chat and, I'll, and we'll try to get to that. And so I'm happy to talk about things that I mentioned here today or things I might've left out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jazz. That was so, um, I, I was using the word meditative. It'll be interesting to hear what other, um, what other reactions may come, may come into the chat now. Um, and, and as Jazz mentioned, you know, you can raise your hand or put your question in the chat and I'm happy to read it. Um, and I do have a few questions that came up uh, kind of throughout and some were answered and there's been some back and forth. Um, one of the questions was about um, the, the sediment. At the beginning, you mentioned sediment kind of conceptually and Lynn Anderson wanted to ask what the sediment is. And you mentioned that in your description that it's ash um, as a material. So curious if you could um, explain that process, the connection to sediment. And she also asked a second question, maybe you can answer both for her. Um, she asked, how uh, are the palm leaves written on? Is it, uh, and then I, I think Eileen also um, asked, are they etched or is there actual printing onto them? 
Okay, yeah. Um, so in terms of the sediment, um, that sort of built up slowly. Um, I started using um, sort of like porcelain and clays, things that were finer um, because they gave me a more fluid line. They weren't based on specific places. And as I started working, I realized that I wanted to extract them from specific places. And so, um, you know, there's stories of like going out to um, certain locations that I frequent and taking some of that dirt and then putting it into the mix that I'm, I'm using these matrices. And um, a lot of it has been from the Hudson Valley um, and also some of the places where I've made these pieces. So um, around South Bend, there was a beautiful clay body that sort of has this pinkish tone. Um, and um, even in Iowa, just incorporating like local um, sediment into the pieces that I'm working with. Um, and in terms of, and then the bone ash, um, that was interesting because that was a little bit more researching some of the um, chemical formulas of how clay fires, um, how it operates in the kiln, but also conceptually when I'm working with it raw. So there's, I think a lot of that bone ash was synthetic. So you can get some real bone ash. It's, it's not actually cremains of uh, those that are, you know, beloved deceased, um, but it is um, usually like the type of body of clay that I would use for firing later. And um, to answer the question about the incised palm leaves, they're, um, so the palm leaves are cooked in sort of, um, boiled in water and they have like something that keeps pests off of it. And then there's a stylus, it's usually metal um, that's scratching into it. And that's when the oil and soot and maybe cremains are mixed and then rubbed into it, which give it color so you could see it. Um, and it's, um, yeah, so that it's there, it really isn't printed onto, but I think it relates to printmaking. Um, in that way is that it it's sort of like a matrix. And I, I don't know if anyone's actually ever tried to pull a print from a palm leaf, but that would be, um, that question has kind of got me thinking about it. I'm gonna just go through another chat question. And then, um, you know, again, if anyone wants to jump in with their voice, um, Michael Joseph asks, uh, well, he was asking about, do you ever incorporate text into your work? And then of course you got to your, to your book series, uh, which incorporated the text on the long fabric. Um, and I also wanted to say like, um, I, I do consider, so I think that the symbols that are woven into Thai silk, I do want to consider like a type of text because it is, you know, around the 19th century, we're looking at symbols uh, like map language and how symbols represent the land um, and become um, a sort of language on its own. And so when we look at some of these textiles, these patterns really relate to very specific villages, techniques, um, and types of looms that are being used. And so I, I do like to think about that printed, um, but you know, the blueprint of my grandmother's silk as, as a sort of text. Um, another question, um, David Solo, sorry, we're scrolling back a little further now. Everyone is uh, giving you some can I jump in while you're looking, Doris? Oh, yeah, I yeah. Uh, question or comment? I um, well, I'm I'm just so glad that we have the space today for this presentation. It's great, but um, one of the things I like seeing all of your body of work together. I love there's like sort of this intention of memory that just kind of is almost soaked in and like infused in all of the different work, whether it's the rivers or um, the robes. And I was wondering especially about the monks robes like if there's more story that you could share about like that relationship like and maybe where you see the project going like have you had a chance to sort of share the papers with them and are they interested in your process i just i'm just really interested in especially the female monks with you know you're kind of highlighting their struggle there yeah um there's, I, I could go on. Uh, this is such a great question. There's so much I wanna say. So I wanna sort of um, give you the bullet points here. They do, so um, the Dhammananda 
um, BQD um, in Thailand has invited me to make paper with them and to teach them to make paper with the robes as well, um, to use some of the local and native plants. That's been really important. Um, it's been a little bit on hold just because of, you know, just circumstance. And um, so I hope to continue with that. And um, I've gotten a lot more interest too from some of the temples that have started here in the United States because I reached out to them during the pandemic. Um, and those conversations have been going and I have a commission on its way um, specifically to work with certain bikunis and because some of them, um, they are rewriting texts um, that may have um, they're giving their translation of a text that sort of like rewriting history um, through their perspective um, perspectives. And um, so yeah, those those things are in the works. Um, it's been really valuable to me to think about it and approach it in that way. Um, I'm trying to think, were there other aspects of the question that I <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll, I'll uh, jump back to the um, questions in the chat. Um, David Solo asks, when you sew together the sheets in a book, do you think of the resulting piece as a single large work or as a sequence of smaller works? If the latter, how do you approach the sequencing? Um, I'm, let me see if I understand the question. If, can you say that one more time if I'm stitching them in there and if there, is it a specific? Yeah, I think he's asking, do you imagine that when you put all of the pages together, is the book a single work uh, or are the, are the, are each individual page still considered a, a work, you know, right? So how, and then when you're putting them together, how, I guess, how do you work on sequence? Okay. Uh, you know, in the absence of language or narrative, is there language or narrative, I guess, something like that. Um, how do you approach that sequencing of the pages, I guess? There is, that's an interesting question because, so like in the signatures piece, um, that is meant to sort of be an open series, like that could be added to um, indefinitely. Um, and so there is no closure essentially and signatures are meant to be, you know, innards of a book, there's no, there are no covers, right? It's not bound. Um, and also I wanna say that with the palm leaf manuscripts, that type of book is also meant to be modular. So when they're used, um, you, you know, you can move the leaves, you can, um, the way that they're used in like ceremonial purposes is you might take a section here, you might take a section there, um, and you might travel with just a certain portion of these palm leaf manuscripts and, and do a ceremony with certain sections. And so it's, it's a lot more open-ended. Um, it's not, they're bound in a sense, but they're sort of, but they're modular. So I like, I like that, that play because it gives me options. And I like to think that, that the, it leaves the space for the, the pieces to continue and be more open and that they can be mixed. Mm. Um, I'm going to jump in with a question that I wanted to ask about content and um, the question is about self-portraiture and I, and I, you know, as we prepared for today, I have been thinking about um, how your work, you know, you're speaking about uh, your identity and obviously we're talking about lineage and tradition and, you know, going to Thailand to learn your mother's language and so there's sort of the obvious ways that this can be self-portrait. But I wonder if you consider the works and, and, and you know, they incorporate real objects from your real life, your mother's um, dress, your grandmother's textile. Um, do you see them as self-portraiture? And at the same time, I, I wonder, you know, we, we have this really, you know, ancient media right, this really ancient way of communicating and recording information and image. And then fast forward to us working in a digital world that is fast and we're hanging out right now in this magical digital space um, that feels at the same time like the book, but so removed from the book. Um, so I'm wondering how you may, you know, use the work in a contemporary way and to, to reference your contemporary person right, your, yourself, your self-portrait. Do you see the work in those ways or? 
Um, I do, I do think that there, it's so personal to me that I feel like it, I, it's almost impossible to say that they're not sort of like self portraits. That's not my intention when I make them though. Um, I think that, I think it's, I'd or I'd like to think that it's important, um, a, a space of someone like me who sort of has a foot in multiple worlds um, that can be considered um, as sort of like this self, this act of self-determination of saying like, I identify with this because, um, and seeing the value in that. And I'm not sure if I'm conveying that sentiment right, but um, especially now, um, I just feel like there are so many things that can get lost. Um, and I'm really gravitating towards the material, like the embodied existence of these materials um, because there is this physical sense that becomes lost over time, not only personally, but I, I feel that way in my connection with materials that I'm working with. When I'm looking for some of these manuscripts, um, generally I would be accessing them through a digital environment and I'm not able to, I might not be able to touch them to see them, um, to actually see what's the context, the context, what's around them. Um, the environments speak uh, largely to how they come to be or um, why they're there um, and then what they're doing. So that's become a lot more important in the practice of studying these materials and then working with those sort of languages and symbols in my work. Thank you. Um, I want to move uh, back to the chat. Uh, Anna Carthart asks about the soap nut dye as part of the process. Uh, can you explain that? Uh, the soap nut, I, um, I was looking for different natural dyes that were kind of unknown. Um, so it was really experimental and I found it was, uh, it was like a natural hair dye I found in like a super small little like hair shop that sold natural products. Um, and I was reading about it and researching it online and I was like, I've got to try this. And I love the fact that it was meant for dyeing like hair. Um, so it's just, and then I, I used it on the, on the piece because, so I'm like showing it, it's a reflection of how the process of making these palm leaves that like goes, so they're singed, right? So um, where the punctures are for the holes, for the binding rope, and then the edges, um, I'm painting with the soap nut, nut dye to make it darker to show, to reflect that sort of burn. Um, here's the career, some career advice question. Um, Jennifer Patterson asks, um, hi, my children are mixed race teens who are artists, serious artists. Does jazz have any advice for them? Thank you. Oh my goodness, wow. All right, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think definitely I encourage you to get as many, as many stories as you can and learn about some of your roots, um, especially some of the roots that may be really hard to find and dig up and they might be covered up or, um, and to just, for me, it's been so valuable to go down those routes. Um, and then to see like, what is it that really resonates with you? Because I, I don't think I had a very conscious, like a very intentional way of getting to the point where I am now with the work. Um, I, it sort of organically progressed very slowly. Um, and I just sort of followed trails that led me here. Um, and just being receptive to what are those messages that you're being given um, from your family, from the work and from what process um, is working for you at that moment in time. So just to be really mindful and pay attention to what those things are. Um, I, I remember like a lot of this started was because I got an artist residency in Thailand and um, it was going out to the Eastern part where the rice paddy fields are. I knew nothing about my family background um, that my great great grandmother um, had a rice paddy field out in that area. But it was like, when I spoke to my mom on the phone, I said, oh, I'm going out to this, to Pimai, which is Isan, part of Thailand. And she was like, what are you doing? What are you going out there for? 
Um, and then she started to unravel her telling me this story. So by chance, maybe, um, I ended up going to this part where it just felt really magical that my, you know, um, you know, that my great great grandmother was out there, you know, walking from one town two or three days to go visit her rice paddy fields. And that was, um, that was part of my lineage. And I was going there to make art and to um, also learn about the Mekong River um, and how they're flooding some of those rice paddy fields. And um, so, yeah, I, I hope that, um, I hope that your your kids can pursue and also learn, you know, really have pride in identifying with their mixed race um, and embracing being mixed and how complex that is, um, and 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 feel and and realizing that it's a balance, like it really is fluid, um, how one sort of and how it changes over time. Um, I like how that sort of connects to my questions too about identity in our work, right? There's always that going, exploring for yourself and then it ends up in the work. And um, that seems clear in your explanation. Um, Jessica Beckwith um, starts by saying, it's interesting that you spoke about rewriting your work feels as though it holds memory, but in the language of earth and bone, it also feels as though it holds an intention of rewriting or writing forward. Is this something you feel or work with? Can you speak to that? Mm, yeah, I love that idea, rewriting. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, when I started that artist book series and I was transcribing old journals, I mean, I had one from what, like 1986 when I was a kid and I was like drawing what I ate for breakfast and today was a good day, you know, really basic, simple things. But kind of when you when you rewrite your own diaristic journal entries, you're sort of reliving these things and then you're kind of recontextualizing it. So um, transcribing things that I wrote from when I was a child up through something more recent, um, and I'm kind of rehashing it. I'm, I'm going through it in my mind. And so it becomes a really important part of the process. Um, and in that piece in particular, when I'm rewrapping them, it's sort of like I'm putting them away. It's like I've, I've looked at them again. I've looked at them very closely. And then I'm also rewrapping them and I'm putting them away. But at the same time, something so private has become also more public now. Um, and Anne Hamilton, you know, she describes um, the book is a sort of a private voice in a public space. And um, so I, I like that idea of rewriting in, in that context too. Um, and, and I think of the book as that sort of intimate space as well, but it's also a shared space. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I would welcome anyone, you know, we have lots of students here um, who maybe some of this is kind of a, a bit overwhelming for them as they're just learning process. Kathleen Caraccio has her hand up. Yeah. Oh, I don't see. I don't know how to I don't see that. Oh, um, maybe I'm Sabrina, just Sabrina, you can, um, Kathleen Caraccio, yeah. you can unmute her, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I try to type, but I can't type and listen and, and think at the same time. Hi, Jess. I loved you showed the laciness after you pulped some of the fiber. Did you say it was a mulberry fiber? Yeah, that, that sort of lacy round um, piece, it's Thai mulberry, which hasn't been pulped. So I haven't beaten it with mallets. It hasn't been processed. It's just been cooked. Um, and the cellulose has been broken down and it's like this beautiful webbing. It's very lacy. You could stretch it out um, and make all sorts of things with it. It's, it's, it's is so- it the inner bark? Sorry? Mulberry, is it the inner bark? You have to take off something to get to the- to Yeah, the... It's the inner bark, it's the phloem of the plant. Are you cleaning that yourself? Um, that piece, I, I don't believe that I was um, harvesting. No, um, but I have done that before, yeah. What does the plant look like? Is it a tree? Yeah, um, it's it's kind of a small tree, at least the ones that have, um, like University of Iowa had like a whole um, a kozo, you know, it was like a Japanese type of mulberry that they were growing um, and they were sort of, sh sort of shorter trees. 
um, but there are some in Thailand that are, are quite large and thicker, um, but I haven't yet harvested them over there. I hope to try that. It's... And not to hog the questioning, but could you tell me a reaction from your mother seeing all this evolve? Um, I, you know, she knows a little bit about it. And I think for her, she's quite curious. Why am I asking all of these questions? Um, and I'm not sure, you know, I think for her, the past is the past. Um, and it's, a lot of it was meant to remain quite silent. And I don't know, I think for her coming here too, is like, she really had to kind of leave that behind. Um, that was sort of the more fashionable thing to do when you like assimilate and um, to be like more accepted in American society for that generation too. But I think like there's this other side where like, you know, the kids of that generation are sort of wanting to embrace like, wait a minute, what are those things? We don't want to lose these things. Um, so yeah, I, and I, I kind of explain a little bit more to her about it and I hope that maybe I'll show her some of the videos that I've made and see what she thinks. <laughs> you're wonderfully astute. You were fluid. I love what you're doing. You are what you're talking about. It's a blessing to know you and to see what you're doing with it. Good work. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Would anyone else like to um, to ask a question or? Again, if you want to ask verbal questions, we would like you to use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. It's a little smiley face with a plus sign. You can click that and there's a raise hand feature. Yeah. Um, and that was such a beautiful thank you from Kathleen, I want to reiterate um, my own thank you again for uh, just such a beautiful presentation. I feel, uh, you know, so many feelings. Not only did I learn a lot, and I feel like I know your work so well, and I still learn so much every time you explain it. I feel like I could ask 17 more questions um, and to learn more about your research. I think your research is also so fascinating. Um, so, uh, I, I would like to say thank you. And, and if anyone, there's lots of thanks in the chat, Jazz, if you want to, um, you know, spend a moment, we can also, uh, you know, you can have <laughs> a little, raise some love, give everybody some love. Um, thank you so much, um, for this. And I don't know if Stephanie wants to cl close yeah. us out, if, if yes, any last um, minute thing. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much, Jazz and Doris and Eileen. Such an amazing, amazing program. You inspire us to tell stories. You know, it's, it's amazing. So, and to go back in that we all have stories that need to be told. Um, so kudos to you for, for telling them in such a beautiful, beautiful way. It's amazing. Um, I want to... Uh, just announce some upcoming events. We hope that we thank you all so much for joining us today and we hope that you continue to visit us for our upcoming events. Um, I'll have Anna put some things on the screen. So our screen's a little quirky, um, but we have um, a BFA gallery show an artist talk. Maybe I think, and I think you're going to have to stop it and do a little tweaking and have it come back. Um, we have a BFA artist talk, three dates, three Fridays. Um, that will be, there we go. Okay. Um, April 9th, 16th, and 30th at two o'clock PM. You can sign up on uh, njcu.edu slash arts. And then we have two amazing concerts coming up Saturday, April 17th at 8 p.m. The Honeydew Drops. And then you cannot, cannot miss Baron Ryan, pianist extraordinaire in concert Saturday, April 24th at 8 p.m. So again, visit us at njcu.edu slash arts. Um, 
and RSVP and join us. And I'm going to toss this one more time back to you, Doris, to send us off into ripping out our paper and start creating. <laughs> yes. I also want to say, of course, that um, you know, you can uh, reach out to us at NJCU Galleries at any time through the Instagram page. If you have any follow-up questions for Jazz, we can put you in touch. You know, if you think of something and you weren't able to ask. Um, and also, I know folks mentioned the QR code that Jazz had up at the beginning. You know, if you weren't able to get that link or if you want more information about her and you, and you didn't get it, I'm happy to um, send that over to you if you email us um, at the galleries or ping us through Instagram. And and just there will be a um, there will be a recording of this at some point posted. So um, if anyone really enjoyed this and wants to share this, that would be really we'd welcome that too. It'll be on the Center for the Arts website. Right. Thank you again, everyone, so much. And Jazz, bravo. Thank you. Thanks, Jazz. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Be well. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.